Let's start by looking at the genre of the play and how it reflects Shakespeare's Jacobean context, which means that it had its first performance during the reign of James I in 1605, to be precise. The play was written around 1596, so usually we think of Shakespeare as an Elizabethan writer, but Queen Elizabeth died two years before this play was ever performed, so technically it falls under the Jacobean period. Don't worry though, that will only have minor implications in terms of context. The Jacobean period was pretty much just an extension of the Elizabethan one. A Midsummer Night's Dream belongs to the comedy genre, but Shakespeare's audiences had slightly different expectations of the genre than we do today. A Shakespearean comedy, which is very similar to the ancient Greek comedies like those of Aristotle, is one that generally focuses on romantic struggles and ends in a marriage, or in this case, many marriages. The tone is much lighter than other genres, and there is more of an emphasis on situations rather than character development. Some characters are included almost purely for laughs, such as Bottom the Weaver, and have very little character development at all. In fact, you won't see any characters delivering deep and philosophical speeches like you see in other plays, such as Hamlet or Othello. Jacobean audiences also expected comedies to involve deception or mistaken identities. This is evident in the plot device of the love juice and the disastrous consequences that occur when it is incorrectly administered. And most of the chaos and confusion created in the play revolves around the wrong couples falling in love because of Puck's carelessness. The focus on love reflects the central concern of individuals in Shakespeare's context, as marriage was an important rite of passage in terms of society and religion. England was a Christian country, and religious texts espoused the necessity of men and women marrying and producing heirs. So, what else was different about the way individuals were expected to behave in Jacobean times? Lots! Shakespeare's world was a patriarchal one, which means that it was governed by men. Women had very few rights and very little power. They were expected to be subservient and were often treated as the property of the men in their lives. This is clear at the beginning of the play when Aegeus argues with his daughter Hermia about her refusal to marry Demetrius, the ultra-masculine husband he has picked out for her. Aegeus goes so far as to ask Duke Theseus to execute Hermia as a fitting punishment if she disobeys. That seems a bit harsh. To be fair, that wasn't the law in Jacobean England. The play, after all, is set in ancient Athens, and Aegeus makes explicit reference to how this is an ancient Athenian law. But it nevertheless reflects the patriarchal social structure that existed in Jacobean England, too. Theseus reinforces the period's expectation of male authority when he reminds Hermia that she should treat her father as a god with total control over her. He decrees that if Hermia won't marry Demetrius, she can choose between being executed or going to live in a nunnery and never marrying. Either way, she's got no place in her society anymore, so she's pretty much stuffed. However, the women in the play won't submit quietly, and we can see this with Hermia's escape, Titania's defiance of her powerful husband, Oberon, and the moment when Helena throws off the shackles of social expectation and plunges into the forest to pursue her would-be lover, Demetrius. Shakespeare also questions the validity of the social conventions that surround the behaviour of men in the Jacobean context. The typical idea that men are the strong, aggressive decision-makers is challenged through the unfavourable portrayal of Demetrius, who is not successful in wooing the woman he wants to marry. Instead, it is the more effeminate Lysander who captures Hermia's heart with his serenading and plethora of romantic gestures. Similarly, the almighty Oberon, king of the fairies, begins the play at war with his queen, Titania. 
who refuses to play nice and hand over the Indian boy that Oberon desperately wants. She is completely unapologetic about this and willing to fight her husband as a point of integrity, while Oberon immediately decides to play dirty and uses humiliation and magic to get what he wants. The men in the play seem to come off looking rather weak and, in the case of Bottom and the gang of terrible actors, quite silly. In this way, Shakespeare challenges the notion that women were the weaker sex. We can understand this as an attempt to subvert, rather than reproduce, his context's social norms. If the notion of a strong and uncompromising queen sounds familiar, it is because Shakespeare constructed Titania to parallel many of the positive qualities embodied in the recently passed away Queen Elizabeth. Around the time the play was written, Edmund Spencer had published his epic poem, The Fairy Queen, which celebrated the beauty, integrity and purity of Elizabeth. All these qualities are mirrored in the characterization of Titania, the Queen of the Fairies. Get it? Fairy Queen? Queen of the Fairies? Furthermore, The celebration of Hippolyta's military prowess as she is described as an Amazon queen is thought to have been a tribute to Elizabeth's military success, beating off the Spanish Armada. But clearly, considering Titania ends up becoming the butt of a joke when she falls in love with Bottom, Shakespeare is having a bit of a laugh at old Queen Liz, which he can get away with now that she's dead. This probably didn't reflect anything malicious, but was just part of the style of comedy that Shakespeare inherited from ancient Greece. A Midsummer Night's Dream, like many of the ancient Greek works that inspired Shakespeare, is a Menippian satire. These were works that seemed like a great big carnival of craziness, in which the worlds of the gods and mortals mix, and a whole lot of naughtiness, like queens falling in love with donkeys, lets the commoners have an innocent laugh at the people in power. We might also interpret Shakespeare's silly portrayal of the fairy queen, who ends up submitting to Oberon, as a joke about how the masculine order has returned under King James after Liz upset that norm by being a female ruler. Now, if you thought that all the talk of fairies and sprites in the play is a bit left field compared with his other plays, there is a reason for that. Shakespeare was influenced by a cultural movement in the 15th century called the Renaissance. Popular among scholars and the nobility, the movement began in Italy and moved throughout Europe. It focused on the revival of classical Greek and Latin texts that had previously been lost. A Midsummer Night's Dream is littered with references to classical texts. For example, the characters Theseus and Hippolyta come directly from Greek mythology. Hippolyta was the queen of the Amazons, a powerful tribe of warrior women, and Theseus was the founder of Athens. He had conquered lots of mythological beasts like the Minotaur. Also, the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, that is staged as a wedding present to Theseus and Hippolyta, comes from the work of Ovid, a Roman writer. Even though Shakespeare draws heavily on classical texts, the play is still characterised by obviously English folklore. For example, the play is set over the course of an evening that was significant to the English calendar. Midsummer's Eve occurred at the summer solstice, which was a festival of fertility, both for planting and harvesting crops and love and marriage. It was traditionally a time of celebration and people tended to party outdoors. There was also a strong belief in the presence of spirits and magic at this time of year, which is well represented in the play. Shakespeare also blends references to May Day, which is another English celebration, with his representation of Midsummer's Eve. There are a few references to May and specific decorations and activities, such as dancing around maypoles. Furthermore, the character of Puck was also known as Robin Goodfellow and is a feature of English folklore. 
Shakespeare's audience would have known Puck as a playful sprite who loved to play tricks on people. However, he was also known to help with chores, and whether he was going to be a pain in the neck or be a good guy and help you out really depended on his mood. You will find lots of references in the play to Puck sabotaging the acts of humans, such as ruining their ale or the butter that they had spent a long time churning. Unlike the spooky spirits of plays such as Macbeth, the fairies and spirits in A Midsummer Night's Dream are generally playful and their tricks are annoying but generally harmless. This is because, as we noted at the beginning of the lesson, the play is a comedy and therefore revolves around the trials and tribulations of love, always ending happily. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on A Midsummer Night's Dream, check out our explanation of the play's plot summary.